Well, part of the purpose of coming and speaking with you tonight is that when I see patients in the office, I oftentimes get a lot of questions about, you know, what is my, my problem? And today I've chosen to focus on lumbar spinal stenosis. And so what I'd like to do is take you through what spinal stenosis is, um, how we treat it, uh, and some of the new, uh, more minimally invasive techniques uh, that we employ uh, to treat this condition. So let's talk about some of the fundamentals of the spine. Um, you, we, you hear us talk about the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. And spinal stenosis can occur at any level. The purpose of the spine is to hold your head up in space so that we can see and make sure that the, the saber-toothed tiger isn't going to come and get us. It has some natural curvatures to it. The lumbar spine has a backwards curve that's called lordosis. And then to bring us back into balance, the thoracic spine uh, goes into what we call kyphosis. And then the cervical spine rounds it up and brings us back in, into another type of lordosis. How's that? All, right. All these technical difficulties. The other purpose of the spine is to protect the spinal cord and then to relay information from the brain to our muscles so that we can move. At each level of the spine, nerves exit and they relay information from the brain that tells our limbs to move and in turn bring information from our limbs back to our brain to tell our brain where our limbs are in space. So at each level, these nerves branch out. The spinal cord and the nerve roots are all subject to being pressed upon and they can produce different symptoms and that's what we're going to talk about today. When people come in to see me oftentimes they feel pain but they also feel numbness and tingling or maybe they have loss of sensation and each at each level where this, these nerves exit go to a very specific area of the body these are called dermatomes and the distribution of where your sensory loss may be, or the tingling that you might feel, or the pain that you might experience, can all be referred to a very specific segment. It's sort of like a, a road map for us. And in the days before we had MRIs and CT scans, we had to rely on these clues to tell us where your problem might be. So for instance, people who have say a herniated disc or spinal stenosis or a pinched nerve at the L4-5 level may experience hip pain. The pain may travel down the lateral aspect of the leg, cross the knee, be on the outside part of the shin, and maybe go down to the top of the foot or into the big toe. Someone who might have stenosis or a pinched nerve at the L5-S1 level may have a pain in the butt that travels down the back of the leg, the back of the calf, and maybe to the bottom of the foot or the outside part of the foot. These are, are called dermatomes, and when they cause weakness, those are called myotomes. So when you have a, a pinched nerve and at the L4-5 level, maybe your foot is a little bit weak and you can't walk on your heels, which is why we ask you to walk on your heels or walk on your tiptoes when you come and see us in the office. It's not because we want to see you do a circus act, it's because we are actually testing your muscles. So there actually is a reason why we do these things. A pinched nerve at the L5-S1 level might uh, give you weakness in your calf muscle, so you can't walk on your tiptoes. And so one of the questions that I often ask is, do you have any difficulty going up and down the stairs? Yes, I do. Well, what kind of difficulty? Well, I really can't push off uh, um, with, my, with my leg. Oh, well, that says to me, well, you might have a problem at a certain level of the spine. And so I start to formulate a plan, and then we confirm that plan with the imaging. The spine has multiple verte uh, vertebrae, and each vertebrae has very specific components. The front part of the vertebrae is called the body. It has two posts called pedicles and a roof called the lamina. So the posts hold up the roof, and then there are these little wings off to the side. These are called the transverse process, and that's where the muscles attach to the spine. You also have this little projection here called the spinous process, and that's actually what you feel when you touch your back. 
So when you touch your back and you're feeling your spine, what you're really feeling is this little um, pointy part here. This little circular area or triangular area in here is where the collection of nerves lie. And that's where there are sites of compression. These little things here are the joints that connect each vertebral body to each other. Those are called the facet joints. And so you may hear terms or read in your MRIs of facet hypertrophy or ligamentous hypertrophy. And what they're talking about is facet is here and the ligaments, which we'll talk about in just a minute, lie in here. Well, there's not just bone, there's also a disc. Everyone's heard of a disc and sometimes people slip a disc or herniate a disc. The function of the disc has several functions. The first is to be sort of like a shock absorber. Um, it uh, allows there to be uh, compression and flexion and extension, so it also allows for movement. I describe it oftentimes as a, to a remember that uh, television commercial about the steel belted radials? They have the radial tires with the seven cables wrapped around to whatever it was. Think of the disc like that. There's a tough outer covering and there's a, a, a soft inner substance called the nucleus. And this nucleus can leak out and that, that's where you get your herniated disc. Um, but over the course of time of, of repeated bending and lifting and just the activities of daily living, this disc starts to wear out. You get little injuries to it over the course of time and because it doesn't have a, a blood supply, those injuries accumulate and it's not able to heal itself. So over the course of time, it loses its water content and starts to shrink. There's less mobility in the spine and that leads to some of the degenerative conditions that we'll talk about. So when you hear degenerative disc disease, that's what they're talking about. The disc is starting to wear out and starting to shrink, starting to collapse. So there are many common causes of back pain, and the most common cause of back pain are the simple muscle sprains and strains uh, that people feel, or they get. Then there's degenerative disc disease, which we just talked about. So if you compare a degenerative disc to a normal disc, you see it starts to lose its, its height. Since we can't like, talk and use normal words, and we have to make word, big words up so we can sound smart, we call that spondylosis. And then we have the entity called bulging and herniated discs. And I often get questions of what's the difference? And to be quite honest, I don't really know what the difference between a bulging disc and a herniated disc is because you have to take that in context of what the symptoms a patient is experiencing. So oftentimes people will have nerve, a pinched nerve with just a bulging disc. And oftentimes people have absolutely no symptoms and have a herniated disc. So it really depends on the mood of the mood of the radiologist who's reading the report and the symptoms that the patient is experiencing. So people can have multiple bulging discs and in fact probably most of us have them and they're symptomatic to varying degrees. Spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal which I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about. This is one of my favorite words, spondylolisthesis. So, all that money my parents spent didn't, didn't go to waste. Um, that basically means you have arthritis of the spine and one bone is slipped forward on the other. It means that the spine is out of alignment. So I can say the spine is out of alignment in one word. You hear about bone spurs, and those are, we call those osteophytes because we can't call them bone spurs. And they occur where the disc is degenerated. And instead of having a nice smooth transition between a disc, a bone, a disc, and a bone, you can have little bone spurs that form. And that causes this hole where the nerves come out to become a little bit more narrowed. And that's where you get your pinched nerve. We won't talk about the T word. And deformity means a scoliosis, so a curvature of the spine. And we're not going to focus on that today. So how common is spinal stenosis? Well, it's actually very common. At any one time, about 10% of the U.S. population has spinal stenosis. So about, what, 36 million people are experiencing or have spinal stenosis. It's also the most common cause uh, or the reason why people have spinal surgery. It's also one of the most common surgical procedures uh, performed in the United States. A laminectomy is the surgical procedure that we use to treat spinal stenosis. Uh, 